Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's be seated. Hallelujah. It doesn't look like you guys are excited to see us this morning. It looks like no problem. I mean, we can just pack our bags and uh, and go back. Trust me, the, the visa I didn't use plenty. It's the day, you know. It's the day small, you know. So I can as well just uh, pack my bags now and go back. Hallelujah. But for us, it's good to see every one of you. It's good to be back home and it's good to um, see everyone physically. Even though we've uh, remained connected spiritually. Really good. And um, quite a number of things happened on the trip. Um, it was uh, in addition to the other things that happened physically. Um, it was a uh, sort of spiritual exploration for us. Uh, God took us on a journey spiritually. And some of the things that God communicated to us and opened our eyes to see are uh, now informing what we're going to be doing and some of the steps that we're going to be taking as a kingdom community. A number of the things that God has been impressing on our hearts since we started as a kingdom community it's like God just took us to another sp space in the spirit so we can have a deeper appreciation of what God is doing here in our lives. And um, I won't be able to go into the specifics today, but I want to say that even though before now, the Holy Spirit had, had laid on my heart, even before we traveled, that um, it was going to be taking us on a journey of, um, of our spiritual, um, our prophetic destiny, uh, both as a kingdom community and as the finishing generation, the last day church. It was before we traveled. But in the course of the trip, I, I had a better appreciation of why God wants to take us through this journey and a number of the things that will be happening to us and that God wants to see with us as individuals and so I want to use this opportunity to prepare our hearts every one of you you're in leadership you're in the workforce you've been around and you've been in TF Church for a bit gear up prepare yourself hallelujah what did I say prepare yourself prepare yourself there's a love, there's a shift in the spirit. There's a switching of gear in the spirit. And we must align with the heart of the Father. And so the series that we're starting, I don't know for how many weeks we're going to go on this journey for. It's prophetic destiny of the last day church. Prophetic destiny of the finishing church. Prophetic destiny of the finishing generation. And what God is trying to help us do is to see that there is a unique calling and a unique assignment before us as a people. And so today what I'm going to do is to lay the background, and I don't know how far I can go with that. But essentially today I'm going to be laying the background for the series. And please, I want to encourage every one of you. Don't see this as just church service. And don't see this series as church service. Please. Generally, the finishing church is a training center. It's, a, it's an equipping center. That is how God has fashioned us. But sometimes our religious mindset still gives us this sense of we are here to do service. You know, and that in itself has a way of just messing us up. What I mean is this. It's different when you say you go for a seminar. If you go for a training seminar, there's a way you wire your mind. There's a way you ready your mind to receive. Let's say you're doing a revision for an exam that is to come. All right? And so the lecturer has organized a revision or a tutorial session for you. There's a way you wire your mind to receive. Because there's something, tell, something tells you that what I am doing here, I will be required during examination to pour out the understanding of what I'm receiving. 
And so what that does is that your mind is there. And one of the difficulties that we've had over time, particularly as church folks, is that we don't apply our minds to the word of God. We don't apply our minds to the word of God. As a matter of fact, I realize that we apply our minds to, I don't want to use this, just use the word secular teachings or learnings, but, you know, other forms of education. But when it comes to the word of God, we don't, we, we're relaxed. We're relaxed. But I've realized that for us to be able to appropriate what God is going to be releasing to us in this season through his word, we must apply our minds. We must apply our minds. And so the way I want us to see, particularly this series, and quite a number of things that God is going to be doing in the next couple of months in the finishing church, is that see it as that you're sitting for classes that you would write exam for. That a time will come, there will be an assessment, and you will be required to write an exam. That's how we must see the word of God. That's why the Bible says that who, who's, he was talking about a man that looks in the mirror. And then as he turns away from the mirror, he forgets the image that was projected through the mirror. That is the outcome of how we relate with the word of God, religiously. And so I want us to apply our minds. And I want to say this. I'm going to be meeting with some of you individually. I'm going to be having very you know, special sessions with some of us because of the demands of God upon us in this season. And so I want you to see this series that we are starting with as part of the equipping process for the task that is ahead of you. So that you don't just see this as another church service. See this as part of the equipping process of the task that is ahead of us. So let me quickly talk about the learning outcomes for the series. What are the things that God wants, want, wants to achieve with us with this series? The first one is to deepen our understanding of our assignment here on earth. God wants to deepen our understanding of our assignment here in time. Because we are the generation and as a people, we have been called according to his purpose. So that purpose is the assignment. So what God wants to do is to deepen our understanding of that assignment. Why are we here? Why is the finishing church? Why are you not somewhere else? This series will help you have a better grasp of why you are even a member of the Phoenician church. Why you are a finisher. The second learning outcome is to possess a clear picture of our final destination. Yes, God has been talking to us about our destination, but God wants to clarify it. God wants each and every one of us to, to take ownership of our destination. And this is very, very important. Because one of the things that we saw on this trip is how life is happening to people, especially believers. And how it's so easy to forget your final destination. I mean, you will be amazed. I mean, people are losing sight of their final destination. Because life is happening to people. So God wants us to possess a clearer picture of our final destination. The third learning outcome is to be firmly established on the path of truth and eternal life. Firmly established on the path of truth and eternal life. And I'm saying this 
Because I've realized that there is no height in God that you cannot fall from. Seriously. There is no height in God that one cannot fall from. And so what God wants to do is to cause us to be firmly established on the path of Because we are in a season right now where people will walk off the path of truth. There are people right now who are being deceived, but they have no inclination that they are being deceived. There are people right now who have been escorted to hell, but they have no clue that the path that they are on leads to death. And these people are in church. These people are in church. No religious activities. They get blessed. They attend a lot of prayer meetings. Somehow there is a numbness of their conscience. There is a numbness of the God part in their life. And they are not able to discern that this pathway is going to lead to death. To them, they are just living life. So there is the need for us to be firmly established on the path of truth. Because that is the only way we can be safeguarded from the deception of the last days. Because the deception of the last days will be subtle on the path of truth and eternal life. I saw an article yesterday that someone wrote in 2017 because I looked at the date. And he said, only a few Christians will make it. Only a few Christians will make it. Why would that be? It's because of deception. People will actually think that on the path to life, they will actually think so. And it's going to be because, because the, the season that is upon us right now, I mean, it's just crazy. Because of so many demands on your time, on your life, and everything. It's so easy to abandon the path of truth. So easy. And it's so easy to just veer off. I don't know if I have the time, I will show us something. And that is, this is really important for us, particularly as finishers. Because we, we live in a season, because the Bible says in the last days, he said what? Knowledge will do what? Knowledge will increase. We'll, even within the within spirituality, there's so much streams, so many streams of emphasis. So many streams of emphasis. But I have realized that very few of those streams are actually leading people on the path of life. Many of those streams are just trying to get you to be comfortable here on earth while ignoring the things that matter. Like your alignment with the heart of the Father. Holiness. Purity. People are not being taught that path anymore. But yet they are in church. Yet they are in church, attend those prayer meetings. And they think all is well. So there's a need for us to be firmly established. For some of us, we're going to be sent out. Because the finishing church is a releasing center. If you're not firmly established by the time you're sent out, out there with what I saw, what we saw, if you're not firmly planted on the path of truth and eternal life, 
anybody can be easily derailed. And do you know how it happens? And I, and I was saying it, I was sharing with a man. It's, sometimes for some people, it's not even going to be that they're actually living in sin. It's just that they're no longer burning for God. And you can't live in that state for too long. Because it's either you are burning for God and you are becoming cold. So from burning to lukewarm, from lukewarmness to what? To coldness. And then before you know, life is happening. You're busy. You're trying to make it. You're trying to survive. You know, the, the, you know, the, the, the pressure on the Naira. You know, your money is no longer worth much anymore. You know, you, you, you need to earn in pounds and in dollars. You need to get, you know, buy. You need, there's so much. And these pressures are real. But one thing a lot of people don't know is that these pressures are also trying to snuff out the life of God from your life. Where God is no longer a priority. And in time, you will have reasons why that is justified. But if you're not firmly established on the path of truth and eternal life, it's very easy, very, very easy to derail. Number four, to remain unshaken in the face of adversity and the crisis of the last days. God wants to fortify us. God wants to build us and make us unshaken in the face of adversity and the crisis of the last days. Number five, to avoid being carried about by every wind of doctrine. Paul in Ephesians 4 was writing and was saying the reason, I, one of the reasons God has given us this gift of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. For us to come to maturity until we come to a place where we are no longer tossed and fro and carried up every wind of what? Of doctrine. Because there are so many winds of doctrines. They will sound good. Sound great. But when it comes to your spirit man, but before you know it, the truth, that which is the proceeding word, that which is the remnant, that which is the heart of God for the time, is not there. You're not being built on the path that God is set for the times. Because like we've said, context shapes everything. The Bible says concerning the children of Issachar, that they had the understanding of what? Times and seasons. And what Israel ought to do. Because every season determines accurate activity. So in other words, there's a message and an emphasis that is fitting for the times. Doesn't matter who is teaching it. There's a message that is fitting for this season. There's a message that is fitting for this season. A couple of days ago, God, the Holy Spirit was reminding me. And he said, Fred, do you not have been preparing the church for the past 30 years for this season? For this crisis? He said he has been preparing us for the past 30 years for this crisis that we are experiencing across the world today. But I realized that the bulk of the church, all we've been doing is just having a great time. Having a great time lounging. That's what we've been doing. And the bulk of the today, we are still lounging and having a great time. In the midst of crisis. Un totally unprepared for. That's why you see a lot of people backslidden during COVID. A lot of people. That was one of the things we saw. We're having a conversation with one of our family friends, you know, who are pastors. And they were just sharing and just lamenting. After COVID, people fell off. People fell off. 
You're not prepared. And I want to say again, like I've said, I said COVID is still a taste, a fragment of what is yet to come. So by the time what is beyond COVID comes, what do you think will happen to people? People will lose their faith further. We're in a season right now, some believers can't manage loss. Just what I'm saying. Believers can't manage loss. We can't manage adversity. There are people right now, certain things will happen to them, they will abandon the faith. Why? Building. It's maturity. There are people that can't accept the love of God. There are people that can't see love in the midst of adversity and the midst of challenges. Because for them, anything about God is always sweet and rosy. And yet, it's crisis that will precede our exit. There is no doubt about that. It's like the children of Israel. And so a lot of people are falling off the pathway. And so we have to be established. So to avoid being carried about by every wind of doctrine, especially in the age of social media, I saw something yesterday, and I've been telling myself I'm going to project it here because it's online. Anything that you put online is public content, right? I'm going to project it here, and I will play it full. An influencer, a Nollywood influencer, who calls herself an evangelist was lambasting those of us who are preaching against sex before marriage. She said it does not make sense that the people who are saying people should not have sex before marriage does not make sense. And she's an evangelist. And that particular, that particular post had thousands of likes. An evangelist With huge followership of young people, innocent minds that look up to her. You guys will be shocked. She's a, she's a veteran in the industry. She's a veteran in the industry. Has a lot of follow, following. She made, she was trying to, she was, she was I mean, she was vehemently Making a case for fornication. I mean, in the open, vehemently making a case for fornication. That is the world that we live in. In the name of God. Evangelist. I even saw one of her pictures. She wore a jacket with collar. You know that white collar? That reverence. You, you, yes. I will show you. Because it's online. For some of you, this is sounding unbelievable, right? But this is the world that we live in. And she will tell everybody for more, go to my YouTube page. I'm a, I'm a this apostle of Christ. I'm serious. Hashtag apostle of Christ. Hashtag this. Hashtag that. And there are a lot of young people who don't know any better. Because we have a lot of churches right now where we no longer even name sin anymore. So one, we, don't, we no longer name adultery, adultery. We no longer call for fornication, fornication. What we do is we come and just talk to them generally and talk about wisdom, talk about how they can be fine. They don't know that, uh, that fornication is a sin. So they now go and listen to someone like that. It's finished. It's finished. It's finished. This is one of the reasons God is doing what he's doing in the finishing church. One of the things God said to me when he challenged me about this is that, and that's why during the prayer and during the worship, if this is bad, please, let's just, I hope all is well with the journey. During the worship, the, during the prayer and the worship, there were, there were certain things that both um, you, D, and who you said, I can't remember word for word now, but one of them used the word custodians. One of the things that God is asking and demanding from us, the finishing church, is that we become custodians of the truth. 
each and every one of us, we must become custodians of the truth. So that it doesn't matter where God takes you to, you become the apostle of truth in that space. Because there's so much falsehood right now in the church. There's so much. And there are too many influences. So God is calling us to be custodians of the truth. If not, a lot more people will go to hell. So to avoid being carried about by every wind of doctrine. Number six, to keep burning for God like the disciples to the end of time. The disciples, they kept burning for God. It's evident in the way they all died. Adversity couldn't keep them away. Even while John was being persecuted, they tried to kill him. They put him in hot boiling, you know, boiling oil. He still did not die. They, they banished him because banishment was part of the punishment back in the day. They banished him. They banished him to where? Island of Patmos. There he got the greatest revelation ever. Why? Because even in the midst of his suffering, his spirit and his heart were still connected to God. <laughs> John would not have gotten revelation if he was disconnected from God. And John, if John had, been, if John had allowed the persecution to get to him, he would have been disconnected from God. So in other words, with everything he went through, and he was going through, he remained connected to God. So to, for us to keep burning for God like the disciples to the end of time. That's another learning outcome. Then the seventh one is for us to pull down grace for all of the things I have read. Hallelujah. God wants to release grace. That's one, one of the things God wants to do. He wants to release grace for us to deepen our understanding of our assignment. He wants to release grace for us to possess a clear picture of our final destination and keep the destination before you. Amen. And do what? Keep the destination before you. Let me ask you a question right now. If you were traveling tomorrow to, to Washington, D.C., tomorrow, while you are here right now, if your mind will ever wander, where will it wander to? Washington. White House. <laughs> Even if you've never been there before, because of the images you've seen and the pictures you've seen, what do you think you'll be doing? You'll be what? You'll be projecting. You'll be visualizing. You'll be imagining yourself. Your mind, that will be your focus. Your destination will be your focus. But today, that is not the focus of a normal number of believers. And if your destination is not your focus, you can easily be derailed. That's why God wants to deepen, wants us to focus on our destination. That's when, when suggestions come for you to do something that is outside your path or the path that God has designed for you, you will not go because you know this is the path I'm going. Can you imagine tomorrow is your flight, 7 a.m., and someone is giving you an appointment for 9 a.m.? Will you plan it? Even six before, will you, will you ac accept that? No. Why? Because your eyes are set on what? Your destination. Let's say you get to the airport and they say, oh, okay, um, your flight is um, 7 a.m., but there's another flight that is for 6 a.m., and uh, that one is going to the U.K. or is going to Somalia or going to Sudan. Will you be, say because, oh, the time of my own is not yet here. Let me go and... No, your eyes will still be what? Even when your flight is delayed, will you change destination? No, you don't change destination because your flight is delayed. You don't. You keep waiting. They will announce and say, oh, sorry, all the passengers, blah, 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 two hours, yeah, because of... So. Do you, because of that, say, okay, I'm not going this way again. I want to change. I'm no longer going to Lagos. I want to go to Enugu. You don't change destination because 
your flight is being delayed. Your focus is what? Is there that destination? But for us to be able to come to that place, we must have a clear picture of our final destination. So when someone comes tomorrow and sells you another gospel, or try, do you know, like I try to say, another way to view deception, particularly religious spirit is very terrible. Religious, I, I, I have personal issue with religious spirit. Because religious spirit, and religious spirit operates in the church. Yes. There's religious spirit in the church. That's why it's called religious spirit. It's in the church. What it does is that, one of the things it does is that, it shields us from the things that are important to God. It gives us a form of God. That's why the Bible says that, it said, I think it was Paul that was written, he said they will have a form of godliness. That's religion. It will give you a form of God. It will, it will have give you a sense that you are tasting and you are touching God. Because it will have all the paraphernalia, para, paraphernalia of, uh, of religion of God. But it's religion. And then it keeps you numb. It keeps you cold. It keeps you flat. And it gives you a sense that you are okay. Are you, I don't want to do too much. That's religion. And it's dangerous. And so we have to be, our, our, the, that picture of our final destination must be there. And you won't change your mind. It doesn't matter how long it takes. If it takes another 1,000 years, we're going to be here. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's what God wants to do. He wants to release grace for us to be locked. It's called an approach pattern. We call it an approach pattern. You see, when that flight, when that pilot communicates with the control tower and they clear that plane for landing, that plane moves around and because you know you have wrong ways, the moment the wrong way is cleared for the pilot, the pilot takes a position that focuses straight on the wrong way. It's called an approach pattern. It doesn't matter the wind. It doesn't matter the cow. It doesn't matter the bird. It doesn't matter what is flying both in the air and on the ground. That plane will not shift. It's called an approach. You, you can't, because at that point, you can't turn it. It is impossible for any pilot to maneuver at that point, once you set, once that approach pattern is set, that is it. A cow could become, he can't dodge it. You will run through it. Bam. Because at that point, you can't do this. It's an approach pattern. That's what God wants to do with us. Put us on that path where the finish becomes our focus. Because if you don't assume that position, you can still maneuver. You can still be maneuvered. They can still sell you another gospel. As a matter of fact, they can still sell you another Jesus. That is why even people who say uh, we are not exactly in the end of time, be careful with them. Because what that kind of message does is that it makes you become cold and relaxed. That's dangerous. Because some people are saying, yeah. But God is saying, this is it. You, which one? And there are so many instances. You, the five bullish virgins, the five red virgins. The difference between the two of them was what? Preparation. What's preparation? Because it is when you know something is at hand that you prepare. But when someone tells you that it's not at hand, what do you think you do? You will lounge. You will relax. And like I've said, you don't even need to, it's no longer a deep revelation to know that we are in the end of time. Pick your Bible, read Timothy, read Matthew 24, read and see any, everywhere the Bible mentions the last days. And then turn on your TV. You don't need a deep prophet to actually even tell us that we are in the, the last days. It does not require deep revelation. A simple sense will decode it. And so when you have locked on that approach pattern, nobody, no gospel, 
doesn't matter highly, how highly placed the man of God is. That's why you would see some of you can't listen to certain people for too long. Who knows what I'm talking about? No matter how great they are, you can't consistently feed them their messages for one month. Because you will see that consistently they are not pointing you to Christ. They can point you to wisdom that can make you be a great person. Wisdom that can make you gain favor from God. Wisdom that can make you gain favor with man. But it's not pointing you to Christ. And so if you live on that consistently, you see, you will lose this approach pattern. You will lose it. You will lose your, the urge to prepare. You will lose it. You will become relaxed. That was why the five foolish versions didn't make it. They were ill-prepared. They were ill-prepared. That's why you must be careful. So that's what God wants to do. Approach pattern. So God is releasing grace for that. He's releasing grace for us to be firmly established on the path of truth and eternal life. He's release, releasing grace for us to remain unshaken in the face of adversity and the crisis of the last days. A lot of believers are not ready for this. That's why right now God is again in build, equip the people, build the people, train, equip them, equip them, equip them. Because there will be more beyond COVID. There will be more. Are we ready? Are we ready? God is releasing grace to avoid being carried away by every wind of doctrine. He's releasing grace to keep, for us to keep burning for him like the disciples till the end. Like I said, it doesn't matter if your, fi your flights were to be delayed. You won't say because of that you are now going to France instead of you to be going to the UK. You won't change, you won't change course. So the people that God is raising today, because we don't know the time and the dates, the exact dates that Christ will return. If it takes another 2,000 years, we'll remain. I don't want to say this. See, we are the last generation. Spiritual generation. You see, our children, if chronologically, I'm no longer here by the time Christ returns, our children and the generation that will take over from after us will be in the same spiritual generation. Because they will ride on this message of the finish. That's what they will carry on. That's what they will continue to teach. Until the church that is without spot, without blemish, emerges and Christ will be like, okay, I think I'm ready to come now. They won't shift. Because this is the message of the end. They won't shift. It is the same message they will preach. So we will belong to the same spiritual generation. We will be perfected together. So we have to keep burning for God like the disciples to the end of time. Hallelujah. Amen. So these are the learning objectives. And so I want to say please, don't see these as service in the next couple of Sundays. Don't see it as service. See it as your life. But this is your life. Because what is life without eternity with God? We talk about time and eternity. Do you know time is a fragment? Time is, time is fleeting. Time is 80 years, 70 years, 40 years, 30 years. People are, out of, people are checking out of this world. And you compare that with eternity. So the conversation that we are having here in the finishing church is about your eternity. <laughs> Not just time. God is preparing us for eternity. We are not disconnecting from time. No, we are still fully relevant in time. Fully occupied. Because there is a manifestation, right? See, it is when you are living by the power of the age that is to come that your living in time is relevant. See, we will not know how to do time and how to engage with time accurately if we do not plug into eternity.
what will help us manifest the way we ought to manifest and what will help us occupy the way we ought to occupy ahead of the return of Jesus Christ is our ability to tap into eternity. If not, we will occupy wrongly. If not, we will manifest wrongly. So I'm not saying that we are checking out because I heard recently that a man was collecting money and was camping some people and was promising them rapture and then showing. I mean, crazy. I mean, I mean, the Bible points out all of this and was promising them rapture. Guys, eh, you know, if there is no real, there won't be what? Fake. Sometimes this crazy dimension people they pick these dimensions that okay we are nearing this time well, this is so they now start doing the fake of the real and so if you're not careful some people will fall into it because some people fell into it and then some people will completely then discountenance the real because of the fake and that's also part, that's part of the plan of the devil and then before you know, you'll start hearing all these end-time preachers. Very soon. People will start speaking against end-time preachers. Oh, they're already doing them. So do you know what that means? Anybody who has heard that listens to me with this content as this message. Ah, uh, to finish it they are one of them. Now then be that. That's part of the strategy of the enemy. That's why you have to be careful. That's why I say you have to know God for yourself. Because what will help you secure your life and yourself from the deception of the last day is what is the truth that is locked on the inside of you. You'll be able to dictate lies. And then you'll be able to dictate not exactly lie, but not the emphasis. Because there are some words, I mean, emphasis that are not that are in the Bible that are godly but they are not meant for now or they are not the focus they are not the core they are not weighty matters and there are people right now who are feeding off those issues that are not weighty matters that's what we call majoring on the minor things and minoring on the major things That's why you would see in most of those messages, the wisdom to prosper will take like the 90%. Issue of purity, holiness will take 10%. They'll probably preach it maybe once in six months or chip it in. And then the rest is how you can gain favor with God and with man. And that is already a byproduct of the life that you're living. It's a given. If you have an understanding of the plan and how much God loves you, it's a given. What I'm saying to you right now, I sat down, I was in the School of Apostolic Community in Jos, 2004, there about, 2005. And I asked this same question my pastor. I said, how about those who are not teaching the present truth? I can't remember his answer, but that question stood out to me so strongly that I can't even forget it. I was in a class like this. Because he taught and taught and I felt like, my goodness, when he was teaching about deception in the last days. That was when he said that when the devil comes to you, he will not come with hood, black hood, tail behind his, you know, behind himself and then with horns and then comes and says, my name is Mr. Devil. I'm about to deceive you. That's too obvious. Devil is not that foolish. He's been around for a while. No, he's going to come neatly dressed like I am. He's going to speak better than I am. He's going to have more swag. He's going to have more appeal. He's going to have more air, charisma. Those things are actually ties us to men. Ah. And then he will come and tell you empty words meant to deceive. 
The devil won't come like that means, Mr. Devil, I'm about to deceive you. No, he will just preoccupy you. Make you focus on the minor things. Delay you. Tell you no, it's still far. It's not now. Peter said it. Said they will mock. And some of them say, "Shabi, our fathers have been saying it that for two thousand years." I said, "It's coming. Why? Where is the promise? Where is the promise return?" In other words, that's what they will be saying. But if you are not established in this path of truth and eternal life, you will give heed to them. And then before you know, your spiritual life will be chipping away. Small, small. Little by little. Now I want to say this. One of the things emphasis in this season is it doesn't matter where God takes you to tomorrow. I beg you, don't leave this path. We've had the experimentation in this church. Don't leave this path. Don't go Pentecostal. Pentecostalism, the bulk of Pentecostalism is just how you can live good here. Don't go that way. Whatever you do, stay on this path of the present truth. This emphasis. Whatever you do, I beg you. I beg you. Amen. Thank you. I beg you. Don't don't leave this path. Don't leave this path. 